it's hard to, for me to really latch on one specific lesson that I have gained, but I do believe that everybody wants, ultimately wants to be heard. Hello and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. On the show, I interview peak performing innovators in the creative, social impact, and earth conservation spaces who are working to change the world. This episode is brought to you by Brain FM. Brain FM combines the best of music and neuroscience to help you relax, focus, meditate, and even sleep. I love it and have been using it to write, create, and do some of my deepest work. Because you're a listener of the show, you can get a free trial. Head over to brain.fm slash innovative mindset to check it out. If you decide to subscribe, you can get 20% off with the coupon code innovative mindset, all one word. And now let's get to the show. Hey there, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. My name is Isolde Trachtenberg. I'm your host, and I'm super thrilled that you're here. I'm also really excited and thrilled to talk about and meet this week's guest. Listen to this. Evan Stern was born during the driving rainstorm that inspired Stevie Ray Vaughan to record the classic Texas Flood. I love that. Evan Stern is one of a proud few who can claim Austin as his legitimate hometown. That's a, the town is growing. So wow, that's amazing how few people probably are from there. Having caught the performing bug early on, he first gained attention at age 11 with a second place finish in Austin's famed O. Henry Punoff, and has since graced the stages of New York's Carnegie Hall and Lincoln Center. A graduate of Sarah Lawrence College in the British American Drama Academy, wow, whether acting Shakespeare or charming audiences with the turn of a Cole Porter phrase, Evan is first and foremost a storyteller. And you know how close that is to my heart. He's got a sincere love and appreciation for history, travel, and the art of a raconteurship. He's now honored to return to Texas for the first season of Vanishing Postcards, an ambitious project that represents a synthesis of these passions through the form of audio essay. Vanishing Postcards is a documentary travelogue in which listeners are invited on a road trip exploring the hidden dives, traditions, and frequently threatened histories that can be discovered by exiting the interstates. Named one of the best podcasts of 2021 by Digital Trends, Evan is here to talk about Vanishing Postcards and everything else so amazing that he's doing. Evan, thank you so much for being on the show. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's a great honor. Oh, you're very sweet. So I, I'm... This is such an exciting thing, delving into the history of Texas, first of all, into the, into the storytellers of Texas, into the dives and the honky tonks of Texas as a travel log, but as a podcast, what, what inspired you to do this? What inspired you to go, you know what, I'm going to create this travel log and I'm going to make it about my home state. What happened that you went, yes, I want to do this? Well, it, was, it, it wasn't as if there was a lightning bolt of inspiration. It was a very kind of slow, gradual process. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, had you told me, you know, a few years ago that right now I'd be working on a podcast, um, you know, I, I might have said, really? Um, <laughs> but like, like so many, though, I am one of those people who over the last 10 years just absolutely fell in love with podcasting, um, and the um, audio medium of storytelling. I think kind of the gateway drug for me um, was years ago, I started listening to The Moth, you know, just people getting up and telling personal stories without notes. I, I just mm -hmm. absolutely loved it. Um, then you start discovering um, other programs, you know, like the, the Kitchen Sisters, and, and, and there's, you know, different, different stuff. I mean, there, there's a wonderful podcast about uh, classic Hollywood called, you must remember this. There's one about country music called cocaine and rhinestones. Um, and around, and, and, you know, not too long ago as well, um, you know, the YouTube algorithm uh, kept suggesting for whatever reason that I watched these uh, travel blog, travel vlog videos. And in watching them, I would never really see the way that I enjoy traveling represented. Um, I, I mean, certainly it's not always the case, but I, I think more often than not, when you, when you see videos of that nature, it, it's much less about the places themselves. It's much more about the people saying, oh, look at me and how cute I am in this place. Mm. Um, and I, I just kind of gradually started thinking, you know, I, I wonder if there is something that, uh, th that, that I can do. 
Um, and initially I had this um, grand idea that I wanted to do a show that was going to be a musical travelogue of Mexico. Um, you know, I'm, I'm immersed in the gig economy in New York, mm. and I always try my best to get away January, February, just to, to escape the, the bitter cold of, of the winter. And, um, you know, Mexico is my happy place. It's, it's cheap. It's warm. Um, and so I, I initially had this idea that I was going to go uh, kind of explore, use music as a portal to exploring the cultural regional history of Mexico. I was going to go to Veracruz. I was going to explore the tradition of, you know, Cajoneadas in Guanajuato and, um, you know, Corridos in, in Monterey in the north. And I went so far as to uh, produce a pilot episode um, in Merida, Yucatan. Um, about the tradition of the trovas that they have there. And it's one thing to, you know, when you're writing in a vacuum, um, you know, you're thinking to yourself, oh my goodness, this is just going to be the, the best thing ever. This is going to be amazing. And then you sit down and you listen to what you have spent months working on and you go, oh my goodness, I have missed the mark so terribly. Um, it was a perfect lesson in show, don't tell. I mean, I, <laughs> what, what happened was, is I talked all about, the city of Merida, I talked about its history, this, that, and the other, but you didn't actually feel it um, mm. when, when you were listening to it. And I also learned pretty quickly that the, the human voice has such terrific color, shade, and nuance to it, that if you have an actor come in um, to uh, dub over, uh, you know, what was said in English, you just, you just lose so much. Mm. Um, and I realized pretty quickly that I needed to learn much more about audio production before tackling a project of that ambitious nature. Mm. And so I started thinking to myself, well, you know what, might not be as exotic as Mexico, but if, if there's one thing I know, it's that Texas people love to talk and they tell great stories. So mm. In uh, January of 2020, um, grabbed some equipment um, and I went back down to Texas to see what I could do. Um, really, it was just uh, going to be kind of, kind of an experiment, um, but it very quickly evolved into vanishing postcards. Um, what happened was, is I took a look at what I was doing um, and I realized that each episode was a snapshot of a different place. And if there was a thing that the place has had in common, it's that you didn't know how much longer a lot of them were going to be around or that they were representative of broader cultural histories or traditions that, you know, you, you just that are kind of rare um, in, in this kind of fast paced, rapidly homogenizing world. Um, and um, since then, it, it, it became, it, it's, it's been an incredibly rewarding journey. Um, you know, as I maybe referenced earlier, in, in many ways, it is kind of a 180 from a lot of the work I've previously done. At the, at the same time, um, I feel that all of that work really kind of beautifully prepared me for it. Um, and having embarked on this journey, um, I ended up covering like about 1500 miles of, of Texas and um, having embarked on this journey as a solo traveler, um, I'm now really grateful that the, the series is out in the world um, and I can invite, uh, you know, people like you and listeners really around the world uh, to, to join me now and experience uh, everything that I got to do. Wow, that's amazing. And, and it's incredible to me what you just said about how you took everything that you had learned up until that point and reframed it and repurposed it almost into this, this way of looking at your home state. And yet it, it, it is both technical and it takes a lot of artistry. And I'm wondering what in, as part of, as part of doing this project, what did you learn? What was the thing that stood out for you that you learned maybe about yourself or about the people in your state or about the places? What was the biggest thing you learned and how did it change you? Well, there's a lot. I mean, it, it's hard to, for me to really latch on one specific lesson that I have gained. Um, but I do believe that everybody wants, ultimately wants to be heard. Mm. They, they really do. Um, and uh, I mean, people often ask me, you know, when, when I first started doing this, it was, it was in January, 2020, it was before the pandemic hit, obviously the pandemic changed 
um, a lot of what I could do. Um, but I was really, the, the first episodes that you'll hear in the series, I was really just kind of showing up at these places completely unannounced. Um, they really had no idea um, that, that I was going to be there. Um, and it, 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 people ask me, you know, did you meet resistance? Well, we'll really no. Um, everyone was, was intrigued. And for the most part, people were so honored that, you know, someone like me was taking an interest um, in their work, their place, uh, what they were doing. Um, and I don't think too, I, I mean, someone recently asked me too, that, that when they, you know, listen to the, to the series, you know, that, you know, they, they feel as if I'm able to, you know, extract these, these stories. And they said, well, how, how do you, how, how do you make this magic happen? And well, the truth is, is that you, you can't, um, there is nothing that you can do to, you, you never really know what is, is going to happen. Um, but the stories, if you just, if you start talking to people, um, you approach them with respect, empathy, and a willingness to, to listen, um, and you ask them specific questions, um, you just, you, you never know what you're, you're going to get. Um, and something that I it, it, it tell anyone who's maybe interested in, in doing something like this, um, I, I will say that if you do want to, you know, get stories, you do want to ask people specific questions. Um, I would never go up to someone and just say, tell me about yourself. Um, I might say, um, before we get started, could you maybe describe for me your childhood home? You know, something like that. And um, that really kind of opens up the door and we just kind of take things from there. Sorry, I'm taking all of that in. I, I like to take a pause to make sure that I've, that I've understood everything. One of the things that I heard you say that really struck a chord with me was that it's about listening. And the other thing, of course, was asking those specific questions. And were there any, and if so, what are they, techniques that you use specifically as a, as a performer to help you with that part of it? Well, you know, I, I, honestly, I think that, um, as I said, so much of my experience um, leading, pr prepared me in, in leading up to this. Um, and a, a, a big job that I've had for a number of years here in the city is it, it's a very it's a very strange job. Um, I work as a, what is called a standardized patient. Um, that is, the medical schools programs hire actors to facilitate simulations for uh, medical interns and students. Mm. Um, I have played all sorts of different cases. You'd never believe. I mean, they, they've had to diagnose me. I've, I've been the graphic designer. They've had to diagnose with cancer. Um, I have, uh, you know, I, I, I've been the 19-year-old crack addict who suffered a panic attack. You name it, I've, I've had it. Um, uh -huh. But I have learned so much in, in working with these students in terms of how they build rapport and what works and what doesn't. Um, I, I, I think it's amazing how many people, uh, it, it can be applied to interview situations, whatever. Um, you know, you, you give someone a microphone, sometimes they just kind of become a completely different person. You know, they think that every question, you know, has to be probing and every question, you know, has to have weight. But you really just have to remember how you talk to people in your everyday life. You know, how do you introduce yourself to a stranger? Um, you know, you're, you're just going to start talking to people um, and, you know, you, you read their body language and you, you really just, it, it's about establishing trust. Um, and it, 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 and I, I feel that people understand that um, I, I don't think of myself as a journalist. Um, I, I'll be the first to, to say that. I think of myself as more of an essayist. I, I really think that a journalist's job um, is to investigate. A, a journalist's job is to probe. I'm not really there to do that. I, I'm really there just to, you know, kind of have a conversation and, and enjoy the ride and see where that ride takes. You know, I'm not, if, if someone tells me a tall tale, um, I'm not going to fact check that story. Um, but I think that people 
recognize that. Um, and, you know, I just think that um, just, just really, like, like I said, just, just remembering how we relate to one another uh, every day is, is just crucial. Yeah, you're talking, I mean, as you're talking, I'm going, he's, he's talking about integrity and authenticity. And those words are bandied about a lot, a, a lot nowadays, but it really, it seems to me that that's, that that's what you, that, that that's what, what you were use you know, using who you, who you were authentically to meet these people. And I know you said that people asked you if you, if you met resistance, I'm wondering what was the most wild story you heard? Oh goodness. Oh man. There, there were, <laughs> there was a, so, so there's this uh, teeny town called Castell, Texas that sits on the Western edge of the, uh, the hill country. It's absolutely beautiful. Very isolated. The town has a population of six. Wow. And um, I don't even know if, if he's really their mayor. I don't know if they actually have a mayor, but, you know, the, the big local personality is Randy LaFesti. Uh, he's the owner of the Castell store. Um, I'll be releasing his episode in, uh, in a few weeks. Um, but uh, when I was there, he told me that uh, he had a he, he 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 was he took a trip to Cabo San Lucas with his girlfriend uh, they saw this uh, chicken in a bar and he said, you know what? I, I need a chicken for the store. So, um, you know, he bought this uh, rooster for, for the store and um, he had this uh, Billy Bass that was like, you know, one of those electronic things, you know, you clap your hands and the bass wiggles. Well, um, one day, as, as he tells me, he looks over and um, this rooster is having sexual relations with that bass. Oh my! So this thing he tells me became this huge sensation where people from all over the place started coming to town to see his rooster perform, you know, 12 times a day. And he was able to uh, make hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in real estate deals that he was able to sell to the people who came through the store because <laughs> of that rooster. And then he proudly led me into the store where he showed me this, you know, he, he called the rooster cockaroo and the rooster died. And after the rooster died, he had that, he, he took him to the taxidermist and um, had him uh, mounted and placed on top of his good friend, Billy the Bass. And I've seen a lot of taxidermy in my day. I don't think I have ever seen a stuffed rooster and I have certainly never seen a ro stuffed rooster on top of a Billy Bass. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> Wow. That is a tall tale for sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. I, uh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. I don't even, I'm like, what, how do I follow that up? I think I don't. Uh, <laughs> well, you asked, so there you go. <laughs> no, I did. I did. Because you know, the thing, the thing about this is that anytime we tell stories or listen to stories, I think we're changed by them. Even if, even if it's, Oh, that's just the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Your experience of life is 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 changed in some way or another. So I guess I'm wondering how have you been changed by doing this project? Well, it's in many ways it, it's been a dive into the unknown. As I said, it's it's very it, it, it was all very new for me in the beginning. Um, I had to do a lot of learning and I, I really had to put myself out there. Um, it definitely um, tested the boundaries of my comfort um, in a lot of ways. Mm. Um, you, you know, you really just have to, as I said earlier, you have to go up out, out there and just start talking to people. Um, and I usually found that I was way more nervous than the people I was talking to. Mm. And um, I, I was talking to someone else about this um, e experience and someone said, and, 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 you know, she asked me, she's like, well, how do you, where does that confidence come from? Where do you get that confidence? And I said, well, you know what? I, I, I think I've discovered that confidence is kind of overrated hmm. um, because you can't just read a book or, you know, attend a three-day workshop, whatever, and magically have confidence. It, it just doesn't happen that way. Confidence happens as a result of experience, 
Um, it happens as a result of mistakes. Um, and um, I, I think um, I heard somewhere that, you know, what heroic act doesn't involve just huge levels of vulnerability. Mm. Um, and so I, I think I have definitely grown in, in confidence as a result of all of this, but that really uh, just is a byproduct of, of the work itself and everything that you know, has been asked of me to, to rise to this challenge. And that in itself, the, the skills you've built, the ideas that you've gotten and, and brought to fruition is a big part of the change, I would imagine. And I'd love, I'd love to discuss a little bit as you talk about this, what is the process? What was the creative process that goes in to making an episode, to crafting Vanishing Postcards? Absolutely. So each, you know, obviously I do have, each episode does have a subject that I am interested in delving into. Um, there are people that I want to meet that just so you know, so basically um, a, a bit more about the, the show itself for, for those listening out there. So e essentially listeners are invited to join me on a road trip. And so each episode, it, it's produced in documentary style. So, you know, you're going to hear a lot of, it, it, it's not, you know, interview, it, it, it's not talk show. You're going to hear a lot of different voices. Um, you're going to hear some of my narration. Um, and I really work hard to make it an immersive listening experience for, for those who, who are hearing the episodes. Um, but basically, the, the way that I construct it is um, there are as I said, you know, each episode, there are certain issues that, that I'm looking at. Um, and so I just go, I, I talk to people um, and I assemble a number of interviews at the, at the places that I go to. Um, you know, I try to talk to the, uh, the owners. I try to talk to the workers. I try to talk to the people who go to these places. Um, you're going to ask all of those uh, people different questions um, but you're also, I think there, you know, you also want to, there are also some specific questions that I will ask all of them. Um, and then what I do is I, I come back home and I listen to all of the, um, I, I, I listen to all of the interviews and I extract, you know, the, the gold from each person I speak with, you know, I, I could very well talk to someone for, for like an hour out of that hour conversation, I might just take, you know, three minutes worth of, of nuggets or whatnot. Um, and then I, you know, I, I look at everything that I have and I step back and I, I just kind of look for, you know, that what, 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 what are the commonalities? What, what do people keep coming back to? You know, are there opposing views? Um, and from there, I, I just kind of take these nuggets and I weave together a story out of all of that. Um, I really let my subjects kind of guide the way that the, the story moves and goes. Um, the, the most challenging um, job for me is in the, the writing process of pasting it all together. Um, everything has to have, I, I learned, you know, for, for years, I, you know, I've, I've did a lot of performing in the cabaret world. Um, and, you know, even if you're just putting together a show that's, that, that's really kind of, you know, a series of songs, what is said in between those songs is every bit as important as the songs themselves. And everything has to have architecture and a beginning, middle, and an end. Um, so the, the greatest challenge for me is about how I can link everything together um, in the narration as part of a cohesive whole. Um, you know, I think but each episode, uh, you know, I, I, I never totally, th there are always things that I want to focus on, but you just never totally know where it's going to go. And before each one, um, I always ask my God, is this going to work? Um, but so, so far it's, it's worked out. Okay. <laughs> that moment of, Oh, what if this is going to be a complete disaster? I know it well. Totally. Uh, <laughs> and it's I'm so fascinated by what you're saying with respect to the storytelling, the beginning, middle, and end, and the sort of the pattern between 
songs in 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 a cabaret show all of all of those things those elements of storytelling what do you think is the result what is the most crucial thing to put into it and what is the result how do you when do you feel like yes it has worked as opposed to ah it's going to be a disaster well as i said earlier again the most important thing is is show don't tell um and what 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 is always best for me is i try not to i try not to express too much in the way of of opinion um what what is really magical though is just when you have when you're talking to someone and you know whether they realize it or not they they share and tell a story that just kind of beautifully encapsulates everything you know, that, that just really explains the issue with, without, you know, at that point, the work for you is, is really done. Um, but, you know, kind of an example of, of, of something that, you know, I, I did that, that was a challenge um, was, you know, I have an episode that's coming out in, in a bit where I took a trip first to, to Brownsville, Texas, where I, you know, spoke with this man who is the last uh, cook in the United States who was allowed to serve uh, barbacoa, uh, cook barbacoa as it was meant to be prepared, which means it's, uh, it's cooked in a pit under the ground. Um, and that's what he does. He, he, he's serving barbacoa out of what had been his childhood home. Um, there's a pit out back that's in the ground and you know that's where he cooks it. The reason that he's allowed to do it is because his father started it in 1956 and it's been going on for this long. And so I focused on him and I did a segment on him. And then I went to San Antonio and I, um, you know, met a cook there who, you know, talked about cooking up puffy tacos. And um, it ended up, you know, she, her story went in a completely different direction. Um, I mean, her mother um, started this business out of a, out of a garage because it was her last hope. Um, she was an incredible woman, a revered figure in San Antonio um, who, you know, was shockingly murdered. Um, and she talked all about that and, and, and everything. And, and then and, and how she like found forgiveness and was be able, a, able to move beyond and, you know, everything that her, how her mother prepared her and how her mother expressed love through, through cooking. And um, I realized that you know, it, it, on, on the surface, you know, these two stories, yes, they were about cooking, but they were very, very different. But what, what is it that they had in common? I realized that, you know, through their cooking, they were both expressing love. And for me, it, and, and that's how I brought the two to, together. I'm still thinking, sorry. It's all right. <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I, that notion of um, cooking and and healing through cooking and expressing love through cooking, but also expressing love for, I guess, the the heritage and the inspiration for what they did is so important. And I'm I'm wondering if you have someone or figures or people in in your world who 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 does that for you who inspired you to do this and if so is it that same love it sounds weird to say love connection but is that connection uh, one of love and respect what is it about the people or the images or or the ideas that inspired you that comes from that place oh now you're thinking i uh, know of course absolutely <laughs> i mean There, I mean, who can you can you just uh, rephrase the question in a, in a simple in a simple one sentence <laughs> in a simple one sentence for me? Can you say say what you're getting at again here for sure. me? Sure, I'm just wondering who inspired you throughout the journey. Are there any public figures? Is there anybody in Texas? Are there so, any people who made you go, ah, oh, this is what I want to do? Well, what I can say is that if if there is a bar that I am always working towards, you know, never never met him personally. Um, but I am old enough to remember growing up, 
on CVS, there was a man by the name of Charles Kuralt mm-hmm. who would travel the country and he would really just kind of share good news is, mm-hmm. is what he was, is what he was doing. And he, he, he never expressed anything in, in terms of in, in showing these stories, he was able to present, you know, the best of people without it really expressing anything in the way of judgment. And there are many situations throughout this process where I have asked myself, what would Charles Kuralt do? Hmm. Um, and, you know, I, I don't mean to, I, I'm not trying to compare myself to Charles Kuralt, um in the least. You know, I have much more work to do, you know, before I feel like I can get, people called him the Walt Whitman um, of American television. Mm. Um, but I can tell you that that is the bar that I am always working towards. Um, and the greatest compliments that I have received, um, you know, are when people have, you know, heard this series and said, oh, you know what, this reminds me of Charles Kuralt. That's lovely. And I remember Charles Kuralt also on like a CBS Sunday morning or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. His stories were all, you know, when I, like, you were mentioning the idea of love and heart. That's what I remember thinking about his stories was that they were always full of such quiet soul and heart. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, they didn't have to be huge stories, but they were, they always left me feeling better and always gave me something to think about. Well, and, and I, yeah, go on, go on. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead. Well, and I, I, I do believe that there is a great void of that when you look at our media landscape right now. Mm-hmm. There, there, there really is. Um, we live in a horribly polarized, horribly divided age. Um, I, I do not believe that anything that we have lived through over the last five, six years should be normalized. I will be the first to say that. Um, but I do believe that, you know, the, the issues that we are wrestling with right now as a nation, uh, in, in the, the divisions that we're dealing with in terms of politics and race are completely unsustainable. But at the same time, I, I do think that there is more that we have in common than what we realize. And I do think that culture right now is one of those rare areas of agreement. And what this show is, is about celebrating is that culture. Um, you know, culture provides opportunity for shared experiences. And you know, that, that's really kind of what I'm getting at with, with all of this. Um, and, and additionally, too, I mean, how can we expect for people in our rural communities to appreciate what is good and beautiful about places like New York City or San Francisco or even Austin, for that matter, if we cannot appreciate what is good and beautiful about them? From what you just said, it feels like there's a sort of a through the looking glass aspect to your show that you're inviting people to go on a journey with you to to see these places or to listen to these to these stories and to hear about them. When you do that, when you're in that space of inviting people on a journey, how do you decide which stories are the ones that are important to tell? Well, something that's important to me is that so often when we think about art and culture, I mean, we think about palaces of civilization like the the Met, the British Museum, the, the Louvre. But the truth is that art and culture is everywhere. And oftentimes some of the best of it comes from places that you're just not going to read about in glossy magazines. You're not going to see about these places on Instagram. And it's really about exploring that, you know, Detroit gave us Motown, Clarksdale, Mississippi gave us the blues. Um, And, and for me, it's really kind of about seeking these, these places out. You know, if, if you read a, you know, if you read like a tourist guidebook about Texas, they're going to tell you to go to the Alamo. They're going to tell you to go to the Riverwalk, do this, do that. Um, 
but there's so much more to that. I mean, I, I, I had the great honor of visiting a, a town called San Benito, um, which is about you know, 15, 18 miles north of the border. Um, and, you know, th this is, you know, if, if you look at this country, um, you know, the Rio Grande Valley um, is st statistically one of the, the poorer regions, you know, there's been a lot of, um, you know, a, a depopulation, you know, flight, whatnot, but this town of San Benito um, was responsible for giving birth to the movement of conjunto music, um, which is an incredible genre, basically what happened is, the, uh, the Mexican laborers down in South Texas um, heard the music that was brought to the area by the Czechs, the Germans, they heard the polkas, they heard the accordions. Um, and they, they took that accordion music, they took those polkas and they added their own lyrics in Spanish to them, they threw in guitar and they created this whole entire genre of music. And um, the story there is, is, is I knew that I wanted to, to do a piece, you know, on the border. You hear about the border a lot um, in the news right now, but what, what is always lost in the noise surrounding all of that is the culture and the people who actually exist there. Um, and I thought that Conjunto really kind of provided a terrific uh, opportunity just to explore kind of the beautiful, the, the, the beauty that exists there. And I heard that there was this uh, museum in this town called the Texas Conjunto Music Hall of Fame. So I sent a message on Facebook. Um, I, I'd heard that uh, it was founded and owned by a man by the name of Ray Avila. And a little while later, I, I got a call from his son. It turned out uh, that Mr. Avila, his father had died about seven months prior, but that mm -hmm. if I wanted to go um, visit the museum, that they would be honored to have me. And I showed up there this museum, this small town in Texas, and the entire family was there because they wanted for me to know about their father. Um, they wanted me to know about Conjunto. Um, they found a, the president of a record label who specializes in this music so that he could be there with us too. And they had such pride and joy in, in sharing and in, in honor that someone took the time to visit a place like, like San Benito. Um, it is an experience I will always treasure and never forget. That is so lovely. And I'm so glad that you got to tell that, to, to tell that story, to show, to show, to sort of open the window, if you will, into San Benito and into this music. And I'm wondering something, I, this is a little off topic, but do you know who Alan Lomax was? I have heard the name. Um, okay. Please refresh my memory. Well, sure, sure, sure. So he was an ethnomusicologist. And mm -hmm. what he did with his whole career for 50 years, he traveled the world and he recorded music. And when video came along, video of mu indigenous music, wherever he was, he tried to find the music from that place. Mm. And, uh, and there when I worked at the National Geographic Society many moons ago, he came over and he was like, hey, I would love to put together a library. That didn't happen with the geographic, but his daughter, after his death, put up a website. And there is a website that you can go and uh, sort of see the music from anywhere. You can hear the music from anywhere. You just type it in. And if it's there, if they got a recording of it, you'll be able to hear it. And so mm. I'm wondering, for posterity, what is your this library, if you will, that you're creating, this travelogue that you're creating, in my mind, Alan Lomax's version of it is providing us access to music from all over the world that is that could be lost. Mm. And I'm wondering, what do you, what is your feeling about that with the stories that you're telling? You mentioned earlier that these that's, that's their survival is not certain. Mm. The the different traditions and the and even the the you know the honky tonks the places themselves. Mm. What are you going for here? What is your long term vision for vanishing postcards? Well, so yes, so I'm collecting oral history, and I, I think it is really important that we do have a, a record of it. Um, I think in some ways. Uh, this is something perhaps of a bit of a call to to arms. Um, you know, I I, I want to say I'm. It, it's about shining a light on you know what is what is still what is still there, 
um, what we can still go to. But as I said, you know, some of this stuff might not be around for too much longer. So it's, it's really kind of about drawing attention to it so that we can preserve it. Um, you know, I look at my hometown of Austin, Texas as a whole, um, it, is, it is changing at, at rapid pace. I don't think that change uh, is something to be feared um, in, in many ways. I think it is something that um, should be embraced, but we have to change and grow responsibly. Um, we have to ask, you know, why, w- what is it that people like about Austin? What is it about Texas that draws people there? Why do people keep coming? Um, and I do think that it is its culture. And I believe that we as a society need to do a lot more to protect the culture that surrounds us. I mean, most of the places that I spotlight are small businesses. And, you know, whenever a small business closes that, you know, has a great history behind it or or fondness to it, you'll have all of these people come out of the woodwork saying, oh my goodness, this is horrible. This is the worst thing ever. But my question always is, well, when was the last time you, you actually went there? Mm. Um, I mean, it's really exhausting. It's a lot of hard work um, to, to keep these places going. And, and if people get tired or they aren't making ends meet, you, you can't blame them. Um, and this is an issue that you see happening in New York. It's an issue you see happening in Texas, California, London, name it, it's happening. Um, and so I, I do think that you know, the, the, hopefully the, the series kind of makes people think a, a bit more about that. Um, and long term, it, it is my hope uh, that I can expand the map beyond Texas, because um, the, the issues that I feel are ex- explored um, in this series are truly universal. In fact, if you look at the analytics, um, most people tuning in and listening right now are actually listening from outside of Texas. Um, and so I, I think it's important to, uh, you know, I, I want to expand the, the map and, um, you know, if I can do a part to draw attention to, you know, the, the, the beauty the, 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 of American culture that surrounds us, um, you know, that's kind of what my goal is. And it's a great goal. And I'm so glad that you said that you eventually, because that was going to be my next question was, do you want to take it outside of Texas? And I mean, Texas, covering Texas can be a lifetime's work because it's such a, mm. a big place with such a ver- varied set of of uh, peoples and cultures. And yet I love the notion of, of that, what you said, finding those small businesses, finding those people who aren't the ones trumpeting themselves and giving them a chance to to shine. I think that's amazing and wonderful that you're doing that. And I love the notion. And if you could go, where would you go next? Uh, well, I, I have a dream. I would love to drive Route 66 from Oklahoma to California. And I would love to collect stories and oral histories along the way. Um, I, I think that Route 66, so much of why um, it kind of occupies this uh, mythic status um, is because of the the timing. Um, you know, th- there were other highways that were built before, after there were larger ones. Um, but I think, you know, if you journey Route 60, I've never done it, but it, I, I have to think that if you drive Route 66, I mean, you are following in the steps of the, the Okies who migrated to California because of the Dust Bowl in the Great Depression. Um, it was an incredible artery during World War II, so there's that history as well. Um, then it kind of, um, you know, en- encapsulates that golden age of American travel in, in the late 40s and 50s. Then it was decommissioned, and, you know, there was a lot of abandonment that happened, and kind of what does that say, um, you know, about the American dream, you know, is it, a, and, and so there's a lot that I would like to explore in taking that journey. Um, Beyond that, I would also love to take a trip to Mississippi sometime. Uh, Something that fascinates me about Mississippi, I think um, the the writer Willie Morris said that Mississippi is America's Ireland. Um, If you look at it, it has produced the most incredible canon of just literary lions. Um, William Faulkner, um, Richard Wright, Eudora Welty. Um, they were all Mississippians, and Mississippi continues to produce in, incredible writers. There, there's a wonderful storytelling tradition attached to Mississippi, um, and I would love to see uh, what, what I could get there. 
I love it. I think that's amazing. First of all, I've driven along 66 and you will, you will love it, love it, love it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I've Mississippi and, and the South in general has a rich storytelling culture. I, every time I spend time in Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, Florida, that, that part of the country there, if you, if you set a spell, you will, <laughs> you will get amazing stories. And often, you know, it doesn't take a lot of prompting. So I'm, I'm, you said earlier that, that it's just about sort of talking to people the way you would talk to them. The, I guess the question is, have you had people who just say, nope, nope, not doing it. And if so, what have you done if that particular story is important to you, or do you just move on to the next person? Oh, absolutely. Well, there, there is, um, you know, so the the third episode that you'll hear in the series, um, I did at a honky tonk called Arky Blue Silver Dollar um, in this town called Bandera, Texas. Um, it's a fantastic place. Um, again, it was pre-pandemic. Um, so, you know, I showed up there unannounced. And I really wanted to talk to uh, Arky Blue. He's, he's the owner. He's in his 80s. He performs there every Saturday night. Um, I thought, you know, th this guy is a legend. I've, I've got to talk to him. Got to talk to him. He wanted absolutely nothing to do with it. Wouldn't give me an inch. Refused to let me uh, record him. Um, and, you know, he was cordial when I talked to him. We're talking, you know, your one word answers. You try everything. Um, but what happened is, is... Uh, Every, I, I talked to everyone that I could find around him, and everybody had a story about Arky that they wanted to share. And um, what resulted in, and so his refusal became part of the story itself. Um, but in talking to everyone who knew and loved him and had stories to share about him, you really got a terrific uh, portrait that wouldn't have existed otherwise that that I think is entirely charming. Um, and when that happened, I had to remind myself that one of my very, very favorite um, essays of all time uh, was written by uh, Gay Talese. Um, in 1965, he was given an assignment to interview Frank Sinatra for Esquire magazine. Mm -hmm. And Frank Sinatra completely refused to talk to him. Um, but what he ended up doing was he interviewed all the hangers on everyone in his his entourage. And uh, to this day, people say that it is the most realistic portrait of Frank Sinatra that has ever been captured. Um, and so I would, you know, recommend to, to anyone who finds themselves in that position to think of that story and you know, maybe read that story, uh, because that's something that I draw tremendous inspiration from. It's so interesting. I have a friend who, uh, who's a PR expert, and she talks about the difference between marketing and PR. Gloria Chow is her name. And she says, marketing is when you come to people and you say, hey, I'm great. But PR is when someone else goes, you know what, that person, they're great. And as long as it's someone you trust, it, it, it weighs more than if mm. the person is trumpeting in themselves, you know? And so there's something to what you said that kind of reminded me of that, that notion of the other people around Frank Sinatra or, or, or Arky uh, being the ones who tell their tale. And I, I guess I'm wondering within that, I've asked you about the wildest. What is the story that has touched you the most? The one that made you go, oh, wow, I had no idea. Well, for me, the, the episode that, that, that has the most personal heart for me um, is, is the second one. What happened is I went to this dance hall. Um, I, I, I knew that I wanted to do a piece on dance halls. Um, in, in Texas, you know, everyone always talks, always writes about Green Hall or, or Lukenbach. You know, those are the big dance halls, but there are many, many, many more others out there. And there was one I discovered that I'd never been to called Sefshik Hall. It's in this teeny community um, called Seton, Texas. It's about eight miles outside of a town called Temple. 
It's a community of about 40 people. And, um, but on, and there's this old dance hall there called Sefshik Hall that is pretty much trapped in time. Um, by most accounts, it is now the oldest um, family run dance hall in Texas. You know, it, it's a family that, that owns it. This family has, has always owned and, and run it. And um, I went there and I, I, I wanted to, to talk to its owner, Alice, who's 89 years old. Um, and, uh, you know, I had actually called in advance to ask if I could come and talk to her. She said, sure. Well, I got there and um, I said, well, I'm here to talk to Alice. And it turned out, you know, that morning she took a fall and they had to take her to the, you know, emergency room. Oh, wow. um, and, you know, it, and it kind of, you know, you could feel the weight in that situation, you know, what, what happens to this place, um, you know, without, without Alice here. And I ended up talking to her daughter-in-law and, and son um, and, you know, they're, they're committed to, to keeping it going. Um, but you could feel like the, you know, the, you know, I, I feel like that situation kind of infused the, the episode with, with weight. Um, but beyond that, um, you know, I listened to to what I had initially, and there was something missing. Um, I said uh, to, to myself, I said, you know, I'm doing a lot of talking here. I'd like to find someone else who could do some some talking for me. Um, and there, there's an association called the Texas Dance Hall Preservation. And I found the woman who was working at the time as their executive director because I wanted to talk to her just to kind of get some more historic perspective on dance halls. You know, I was talking about the history. I think it's better if someone else can talk about the history other than me that actually knows more. And, you know, I talked earlier about how, you know, you have those moments where someone just kind of, you know, tells a story or shares something that just beautifully illuminates everything. And um, I was talking to her and I asked, I said, you know, there are so many causes out there in this world that are, that are worth devoting attention to. I said, you know, why are dance halls important to you? And she said it, it, it was, it, it became an incredibly emotional interview that I, you know, was not expecting at all. But she said that, you know, those places have a lot of heart and that her fear was that we're getting away from that as a society. And, you know, she, you know, ends up crying. She's saying, you know, these places, you know, people go there, you know, it's not just about the fun. It's, it's not just about the dancing. Um, it's about, you know, it, it's about cleaning the roof. It's about cleaning the toilets. And she says, I see so many people working so hard to keep these places going. And, you know, and, and of course it, it just perfectly illustrated what the Shulock family, you know, were, were doing, you know, the, the, the daughter-in-law, the son, you know, they, they work, you know, five days, they do not take days off. You know, they have regular jobs that they keep Monday through Friday, and then they're there on the weekends. And um, I, I think that it beautifully exemplified their story in addition to just about every other person that I talked to in the series as a whole. That is beautiful. And I'm so grateful that you shared that, that moment of, of talking to her and also the story of dance halls in general or, or anything that we do because we love it. Mm. You know, we, we do it because whatever it is, whatever that thing is that you do because you love it. And particularly these places where one of the things that I think, Evan, that, that you've highlighted that I think is so incredible is that you've taken, to, you've highlighted places that aren't going out for fame. You know, these are people and places that are just living, live, doing their thing and living their lives day in and day out, year in and year out. And they're not going to, to be a celebrity. They're not trying to be world famous, for example. And yet you've shown the light on them. And I think that's so, it's powerful. Mm because of that, because they're living their lives and doing something hopefully that they love, like with the dance hall story, and they're not looking for accolades. And yet you've given them a platform. Mm -hmm. And I'm so grateful that you've done that. 
Well, I will say too, it's not even that, I, I think a lot of them as well feel a responsibility to the people who, who go to these places. Mm-hmm. You know, like a, a dive bar isn't just a place to, to grab a beer. You know, a, a dive bar represents an entire community. Um, you know, a dive bar, a dance hall, these are all places where people go to, to belong. That's, that's, that's what all of these, that's another through line that I think these places have in common, Mm. you know, whether it's a barbecue joint, a dive bar, a dance hall, people go to these places for community and for places to belong. And I think that it's, it's, it's important to highlight that aspect as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I agree. And interestingly, because people come and go, like you said, there are a lot of people who who come to Texas, uh, especially Austin has, has ballooned. Uh, I guess the question that's come that's uppermost in my mind right now is culturally the culture of places changes, right? And so as the culture evolves, I, I know that you're a lot of what vanishing postcards is about is, is capturing that, before it goes away, before it's no longer in its current form. Are there things that you've done that have been uh, sort of in the process of changing or something is over and something new is coming to take its place? And if so, what have those things been? Um, you mean my work or yeah, places yeah, like, I've been? Mm-hmm. Like, I guess I'm not asking the question very well. I'm just wondering about culturally, your the vanishing postcards project is focused on sort of the smaller uh heart very heartfelt places and people in in texas now and perhaps and perhaps hopefully someday elsewhere and as as the culture changes in those places or for those dance halls have you captured in any of the episodes that you've done that change taking place absolutely um, the, the very first place that I went to, um, was a bar called, uh, the, the dry Creek cafe. Um, it, it's been there for about 70 years. Um, it, it, when it first opened in the early 1950s, it, it really basically sat on the edge of the country. Now, it, not only is it no longer country, um, it's now pretty much surrounded by mansions. Mm. Um, it, it, it's now basically, it's this ramshackle dilapidated dive that is surrounded by some of the priciest real estate in all of Texas. Hmm. Um, But this bar has survived. um, And I think it's one of the few places that you can go where you're reminded that, you know, before the the tech uh, millionaires invaded the hills, the hills were actually home to cedar choppers, which was this um, Appalachian subculture. Um, And uh, the the very first person that I interviewed in, in Texas for the series was Angel, their bartender. Um, this was a tough dame, you know, raspy voice, you know, just you know, chain smoker, you <laughs> know, just just fabulous, you know, just tough as nails woman. Um, she was incredibly um, reticent to uh, to speak with me, it, get, getting her to talk on the record and letting allowing me to record her um, just took every ounce of charm. <laughs> that I could possibly muster. But when she found out that I was okay with cussing, um, she opened <laughs> right up. She let the F-bombs fly. Um, we had a terrific time. Um, and uh, very sadly, I think about um, four months or so um, after I, I interviewed her, she died. Um, oh. What was remarkable about Angel is, um, as I said, the, the place opened in, um, I, I think it was 1953, um, she was only the third bartender to ever work there. Wow. Um, and so I, I'm incredibly grateful that I, you know, captured her her voice and, and I have that record of her. Um, but, you know, you, you have to ask, you know, when when someone like that goes, you know, um, you know, what does that how does that change a place? You know, what does that do? Um I was actually just back in Austin last week, um, and I went there to to visit the place to, 
you know, just see if there was some additional footage I could get that would help bring the season to, to a close, um, just to kind of see how that change had affected things. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, so there, there are now just, there, there are now like a few bartenders there who are like trading duties and whatnot. Um, but I think what's kind of beautiful is that those who have uh, filled in, you know, were all regulars who, who knew and loved and, and cared about the bar. Um, and, uh, you know, they dedicated a section of the bar to Angel where they have, you know, her pictures and some mm. things that she loved. Um, and um, it was it was just kind of interesting and reassuring to see um, how, you know, yes, you know, when a beloved you know, figure uh, leaves, it, it, it's hard and it's challenging. Um, but if the community is there, it will, con it will find a way to continue. At least for now, I'm, I'm grateful to see that, to know that the Dry Creek is still there and that those who, who love it um, are doing their part to, uh, to keep it going. I'm so glad to hear that story. That is wonderful. Evan, I want to thank you so much for for taking the time to talk to me about this. It's it's such an important topic because it isn't one that that we tend to focus on. So I'm really grateful that you took the time to tell me about banishing postcards and to tell me about the the, the culture and the people that you are uh, capturing, if you will, for for all of us, for all of us to enjoy. And I, and if you're listening to this, you need to go check out Vanishing Postcards. I've listened to a few episodes and it's fabulous and amazing. Evan, if you wouldn't mind, I would love it if you would give whatever social media uh, mm -hmm. that you have so that if people want to find you, that they can. Absolutely. So the, um, you know, if you search uh, Vanishing Postcards on Instagram, uh, you'll find it there. Um, it also has a, a, a Facebook page. Um, just search Vanishing Postcards. It, it should turn up. Um, you can also find me on Instagram as well. I'm at Evan Stern NYC. Um, and, um, you know, I, I thank you so much for, and oh, and, but most important, most crucially, um, you know, it, it, please uh, go find, listen to, subscribe to Vanishing Postcards. Um, since this is a podcast, uh, you know, whatever you're listening to this on, I'm quite confident that you'll find us there. We're on Apple, we're on Spotify, we're on all the, uh, you know, whatever platform is out there, we're more than likely uh, on. And I'd be most honored if you, you'd consider giving us a listen. Awesome. And I will actually put all of that in the show notes so that if you're listening to this and you've seen the show notes, you'll be seeing the links to all of it. I just, people learn differently. So I like giving both the audio and the sort of, you can read it visual for it. Uh, Evan, again, I'm really grateful that you took the time to chat with me. And I, I have one last question, if that's okay. Of course. It's a question I ask everybody who comes on the show and it's a silly question, but I find that it yields some profound results. And the question is this. If you could skywrite anything for the whole world to see, what would you say? What would I say for the whole world to see? Oh my goodness. Yeah. See, I, I feel like I need to say something profound like Buddha or something like that <laughs> now. Or Yoda, my goodness. Well, I've had people I mean, say, eat your veggies. So it does not have to Look, be. <laughs> okay. But I, I mean, it, it is a cliche. Um, I've, I've heard it many times. Um, but I, I do believe that there is something to be said for the fact that if I were to write this in the sky, I would say luck is the result of preparation meeting opportunity. I absolutely believe that to be true. Um, I always do my best to be, uh, you know, prepared and uh, educate myself and, you know, and, and be ready so that, um, you know, when opportunity comes, you know, luck can luck can happen. I love that. I think that's a great way to end this episode. Evan Stern, you are fabulous. And I'm so glad that you were here. Thank you. This is the Innovative Mindset Podcast. You have been listening to my wonderful conversation with Evan Stern, who is the host of the Vanishing Postcards podcast, which of course, you know, you need to check out. If you're liking what you're hearing, do me a favor, leave a review, let me know, comment, however you'd like to get in touch. I would appreciate it. Until next time, this is again, Isolde Trachtenberg reminding you to listen, learn, laugh, and love a whole lot.
Thanks so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Please subscribe to the podcast if you're new. And if you like what you're hearing, please review it and rate it and let other people know. And if you'd like to be a sponsor of the show, I'd love to meet you on patreon.com slash innovative mindset. I also have lots of exclusive goodies to share just with the show's supporters there. Today's episode was produced by Zolda Trachtenberg and is copyright 2021. As always, please remember this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Past performance does not guarantee future results, although we can always hope. Until next time, keep living in your innovative mindset.